escape was to go backwards or to go into a small portal in the cemetery. The soldiers, the 50 soldiers, came in front of the large crowd of people. And then, from the direction the procession had come, hundreds of soldiers marched up in formation, in uniform, holding their M16s out in front of them. The crowd got very quiet. In the front, there was nowhere to go because there were so many people behind them. People started to step back and gasp. The soldiers kept on marching. It was as if watching something in slow motion. And as they came in front of the group of people, the first line and then the second line of people, the Indonesian soldiers picked up their guns. Just before we did, they did that, Alan suggested that we go to the front of the crowd. Because although we knew that the Indonesian soldiers had committed massacres in the past, they had never done it in front of Western observers, in front of foreign eyewitnesses. I had my tape recorder out. I put on my headphones and I held my microphone out like a flag. Alan put the camera above his head and we walked to the front. The soldiers came up and without missing a beat, without any warning, without any provocation, they lined up in front of the people and they started mowing them down from right to left and back again. And people were running. Most were shot in the back. They were trying to run backwards, but they couldn't get out of the way. At the same time that they opened fire, another group of them enveloped us. One grabbed my microphone, threw me to the ground, and started to punch me in the face, kick me in the sides, and beat me with rifle butts as the others joined in. Alan was right behind me. He got a shot, a photograph of the soldiers opening fire. And as they beat me, he threw himself on top of me. They had dragged us right before the line of fire, right behind it. And then they beat him and beat him, swinging their rifle butts like bats until they fractured his skull. We were lying in the ground, Alan was covered with blood, and the only thing we could say was, we are from America. At that point, they put the guns to our heads and decided whether or not to execute us. We kept shouting, we're from America. They had stripped us of everything, all of my equipment, our bags. The only thing I had left was my passport in my pocket. I took it out, they grabbed it, threw it back at me, but they heard what we said, and we kept saying, we're from America. We can only assume it was for that reason that they pulled the guns away from our heads. After all, we were from the same place their weapons were from. So there we were lying on the ground, Alan covered with blood, but we were very lucky. We were alive. All around us, Timorese were lying in the road, dead. The Timorese that hadn't been picked off at the beginning, soldiers moved in and picked them off one by one. As we were lying there, they dragged an old Timorese man next to us, beat him into a sewer ditch behind us, and every time he picked up his head, they would beat it down with a rifle butt or with their boot. At that point, a jeep came by, not a military jeep, and we were able to get into it. And the person who was driving picked up the old man and put him in the, the jeep. We drove off about 100 yards down the road, some young Timorese flagged us down, and then dozens climbed into the Jeep, inside on top, hanging off the spare tire in the back. Some would fall off, others would pile on, because the soldiers were surrounding the cemetery and killing and beating people inside. In that way, we drove as a human mass to the hospital. At the hospital, people were already being dragged in. One young man was being operated on, another had his arm almost ripped off from gunshot, another had a bullet wound in his back, and more were coming in. We left the hospital, went into two places of hiding to figure out what to do. We were able to escape East Timor that day on the last flight out. Again, the Timorese were not that lucky. Just before we left, religious and medical people told us that they were not allowed to go up to the cemetery. The soldiers had sealed it off to administer first aid or last rites. A young man who was behind us in that crowd named Kamal Bamadhaj, a New Zealander, was carrying a camera. He stepped back when we stepped forward. He was shot. The Red Cross found him hundreds of yards down the road. He was lying in the road waving his New Zealand passport. They picked him up and a two-minute ride to the hospital became a 25-minute ride because the soldiers kept detaining them, and Kamal Bamadhaj bled to death. The 
The reason you were able to see the video that you saw today was that there was a British video man in the cemetery. He wasn't at the front, but he was in the cemetery. And the shot you saw was when the, sh when the soldiers opened fire and people ran, stumbling over each other, into the cemetery. He was able to photograph that. And as the soldiers surrounded the cemetery, he realized he was going to be taken. So he buried his videotapes in a fresh grave, was arrested. Nine hours later, he was released. In the cover of night, he went to the cemetery, dug up those videotapes, and had them taken out of the country. And that's what you saw. The Indonesians would not allow any international investigation of the massacre. Instead, they put out their own military government preliminary report, in which they said a few renegade soldiers got out of hand. This was certainly not government policy, they said. But it was not a few renegade soldiers who sealed off the cemetery after the mass killing, not allowing any religious or medical people to save the people who were bleeding to death. This was government policy. It was not a few renegade soldiers who didn't allow the Red Cross to see the wounded for more than two weeks. This was government policy from the top in Jakarta. It was not a few renegade soldiers who are trying survivors of the massacre under anti-subversion laws if found guilty, they face the death penalty. This is government policy. In December, the Indonesian government officially banned Alan Nairn and me from returning to the country, saying we're a threat to national security. In February, they banned all foreign journalists from East Timor. The State Department has called the Indonesian preliminary report serious and responsible. On February 26th, State Department spokesperson Richard Boucher said the U.S. was encouraged by the Indonesian actions after the massacre. Just an, a few hours before he made that statement, all journalists were banned. He didn't mention that. The State Department is also calling for an increase in military training aid to Indonesian soldiers, saying that aid instills democratic and humanitarian standards in Indonesian soldiers. If the Indonesian government wants to cut down on negative publicity, the answer is not to beat and kill and ban journalists, but to stop the killings, the detentions, and the tortures that have continued even since the November 12th massacre. In addition, they should abide by the two UN Security Council resolutions passed after the 1975 invasion, just like those passed against Iraq, calling on Indonesia to withdraw from East Timor without delay. But Indonesia is not going to do this without pressure. Our government provides $50 million in direct military and economic aid to Indonesia, plus approval for hundreds of millions of dollars in US weapon sales. While the Bush administration and Congress have condemned the massacre, as long as the United States refuses to cut off aid, it remains complicit in Indonesia's continued reign of terror against the people of East Timor. Thank you. What we're talking about here is not policy, but crime, more specifically a criminal policy on the part of the government of Indonesia and the government of the United States. I mean that in a very specific, objective sense. Indonesia invaded East Timor early on the morning of December 7th. 1975. On the morning of December 6, 1975, President Ford and Henry Kissinger were in Jakarta meeting with President Suharto, the ruler of Indonesia. The Indonesian military had recommended to Suharto in September of 1974, more than one year prior, a military move against East Timor. This is according to the CIA cables that were coming back to Washington. Suharto, however, told his generals to hold off. 
He was nervous. He was nervous because, as the State Department